Uh, welcome to our web talk or fireside chat with Professor Jonathan Gosling, a good friend of FBC and founding director of Coaching Ourselves. We met in Montreal a couple of years ago, and I always learn so much every time we have the chance to talk. The idea of calling our web talk a fireside chat is to invite you to carefully listen and connect as if we were all comfortable close to the fire. Uh, I would like to thank our partner Phil Lanier from Coaching Ourselves for making it happen. Uh, Coaching Ourselves is an initiative for managers to learn together from their own experience in their own workplace. Phil is always also a member of the FDC International Advisory Council. Uh, my name is Viviane Barreto. I am the Associate Dean for Global Strategy at FDC and I'm flattered to host this chat. Hi Phil, a few words about Coaching Ourselves and the partnership with FDC. Thank you very much, Vivian, and hello, everybody. Um, Coaching Ourselves is a business that uh, we started about 12 years ago. Uh, myself, uh, Professor Gosling, Professor Mintzberg, uh, were part of the, uh, the founding uh, uh, partners. What we do at Coaching Ourselves is we help organizations connect their people so that they can learn from one another in a peer coaching or peer learning approach. And we provide discussion guides written by Professor Gosling, Professor Mintzberg, and about 60 other management and business thinkers. We've been working with FDC now for uh, five or six years. It's absolutely fantastic working with FDC. Our values are completely aligned, and uh, I look forward to uh, having some of you try coaching ourselves in Brazil. Thank you, Phil. Um, who is with us today? Uh, we have a group of C-level from large organizations, clients um, of FDC and some special guests such as members of the FDC, International Advisory Council, plus guests from partner business schools and FDC faculty. Uh, what is important for us to know to make our chat work well, we will keep your mic and video closed. And if you would like to make any question or comment, please click on the chat or Q&A and write a message and I'll do my best to address them all. After this chat, we'll email you the Coaching Ourselves module, Simply Managing from Reflection to Action, authored by Jonathan Gosling. Um, so you have more information about how the methodology works. Thank you for being here and for joining our web talk. Um, Jonathan, thank you very much for being with us. Always a big honor to talk to you. Uh, well, every time I hear about Jonathan, his article, Five Minds of a Manager, dated 2003, uh, co-authored with Henry Mintzberg, comes to my mind. Uh, by the way, I reread it very frequently, and uh, I always make more connections. And it's very useful, especially in current managing times, right? Uh, some introductions. Um, Professor Jonathan Gosling is Emeritus Professor of Leadership at Exeter Business School and also holds visiting positions at Renmin University of China School of Philosophy, Ashbury College, UK, University of Auckland, New Zealand, the Leadership Institute. Jonathan is also an associate with a number of other consultancies and NGOs, including the International Center for Humanitarian Affairs in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, he's also a professor and director of the Center for Leadership Studies and head of executive education in the School of Business and Economics at the University of Exeter in the UK. Professor Gosling, um, advises several companies, international agencies, and government departments on their leadership-related issues. He's a fellow of the Leadership Trust Foundation, Lancaster University's, Le University's Leadership Center, and the Singapore Civil Service College. He served more than 10 years on the advisory board of the UK Defense Academy and is a co-director of the European Leadership Center. Jonathan has authored lots of books, dozens of book chapters and articles, and you can have more information about him uh, on www.jonathangosling.com. Um, 
also Professor Jonathan Gosling has dedicated a big portion of his time writing about leadership, reflectiveness, and the pleasures of power. Um, as the organization's re response to the COVID-19 crisis, there are special challenges for those of us involved with the people aspects uh, uh, in the organization. And uh, deepening our sensitivity and understanding of ourselves and others is crucial. And this is made easier by clear conceptual appreciation of how normal, or how normal organization dynamics are amplified and changed in such extraordinary circumstances. So during the next hour, we'll be talking to Jonathan about it, about what is important to lead now, to lead now, what is important to know, um, how, how to help others, uh, what we can't miss, types of powers, and how we can make the best use of, of all the strengths we have. So Jonathan, please, the floor is yours. We are excited to hear and to learn from your ideas and reflections. I would like to start our conversation uh, asking you about what is about your reading of what we are all going through right now. Oh, thank you very much, Vivian, and, and greetings to everybody who's joining this talk. Uh, thank you very much for your time to join me in trying to uh, answer your question what are we involved in what is going on here and uh, it must be particularly difficult for people who are responsible for large enterprises or government departments and policy big institutions where everybody is looking to you for some idea of what's going to happen in the future and really none of us know but the not knowing is not an answer which provides the kind of security and stability that people want uh, to be dwelling with uncertainty while is, is realistic let's say that's realistic so to be truthful where we are now is a kind of state of not knowing at least not knowing about even two weeks into the future let alone six months or two years but I think we can know a bit more about where we are in the present. And that might give us some clues to how we will deal with whatever comes next. So I, what I hope to do in, in this talk is to give some ways of thinking about the kind of trouble leaders are in at the moment. Um, so I, so I, I hope I'm, this is answering your question about what's, what's going on now. Um, and, and let me, let me lay it out very briefly, first of all, and see if, see if that's a good start. Um, I think a key feature of the current situation, of course, associated with uncertainty and with the danger, the threat of disease and death and with the existential threats to our businesses, our economies, to social order, policing, and so on, uh, all of these create anxiety. And a large part of the effort of government uh, messaging, public relations, uh, government policy, the mobilization of various kinds of science is clearly aimed at containing anxiety. Now, anxiety can't be rubbed out. It's, it's no good saying to a child, don't be anxious, unless you're able to provide some of the comfort and reassurance that the child needs. And it's the same for adults. If our leaders tell us, don't be anxious, it'll be okay. We know, we would like to believe them, but we know it's not so straightforward. So uh, leaders may try to explain rationally the basis on which we will try to proceed. But even that rationalization is so full of uncertainty that the anxiety isn't simply wiped away. 
the best we can do is help people to manage their own anxiety. So this is very important. We provide the conditions in which other people manage themselves. We don't manage the people, we enable them to manage themselves. Uh, in uh, one of the Coaching Ourselves topics, we describe this as catalytic leadership because a catalyst is a temporary architecture, something we build temporarily that enables new realities to emerge. So a clear leadership policy, for example, about how we will proceed for the next few weeks, a clear leadership policy acts like an architecture, a kind of pavilion that makes people feel safe. I guess we all have the experience of being outdoors in a big open space and then going into a more enclosed part, maybe with a, a little roof or even just uh, a, a, a fence around and we feel more secure. There is an architecture that enables us our unconscious anxiety to be lessened enough for other parts of our brains and our personality to become available. So a very important part of the leadership contribution now is to provide containment for anxiety. We can't make it go away, but we can contain it. Uh, and if I, if I may for a few minutes lay out some of the ways I think that anxiety uh, impacts on the sort of leadership we observe around the world at the moment. Uh, I've described a particular and functional kind of leadership, a positive kind of leadership, as catalytic leadership, providing the temporary architectures in which people can feel secure enough. Um, there's, there are other kinds of leadership which the anxiety gives rise to, because we have all, as we grow up, learnt defences against anxiety being a, a newborn infant, being a struggling toddler and child, being a teenager. These are not easy experiences and we cope with them. And everybody on this call has coped with them very well to become functioning adults, uh, able to make creative contributions to complex organizations and society. Um, but we've done this by mobilizing effective defenses against all the things that make us anxious in life. That we've defended ourselves enough that other parts of our brain and our personality becomes available. Uh, but in a mass of people, and even in a small group of people, even in a family unit, those levels of anxiety are always around. And they give rise to a number of behaviors which sometimes require leadership. That I don't say they require leadership to, to uh, make them go away, but they create their own kind of leadership. So one of the common defenses against anxiety, when a group of people feel anxious, they like to fight or fight. They, they want to find an enemy or they want to run away from the situation. They blame somebody, they scapegoat it. You know, it's the Chinese, it's the Americans, it's whoever it is, the immigrants, it's the whatever it is. It's, or it's, uh, it's, the, it's the virus, it's nature, or it's a vengeful God. There is somebody to fight against with this. And, and that urge to fight creates, gives rise to fight leadership. And people push to, 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 um, to throw into the foreground leaders who will represent that desire. Uh, or there are also maybe a response to flee, for flight, to, fl to disappear into, yeah, there are many good ways to fight, into sports or video games or alcohol or drugs or pornography or all kinds of ways which are flight from the reality that we face. 
And flight also gives rise to its own kinds of leaders, often countercultural and rebellious leaders. So, so that's one of the responses to anxiety is fight or flight. Another response is dependency. We, if I feel very anxious, I want to be able to depend on a parental figure, a mother or father or somebody, or if not a person, a theory of the world. Uh, maybe it's a religious theory, or maybe it's a sci-fi theory about aliens or something. Um, so there would be, so an idea that if I depend on this completely, I, my, I will be saved from my anxiety. And whole groups require this. And anybody who leads an organization will know that there are times when all of a sudden it seems that pe nobody can make a decision without you. You suddenly realize, my goodness, everybody seems to be dependent on me to make a decision. Now, as a leader, you can collude with that, go along with it, but also you can be curious and think, now why? What is making people so anxious that they feel they must only be dependent in this, in this way? Uh, but still, there are also leaders who respond to this dependency need and try to satisfy everybody's needs, to rescue everyone, and to, uh, and it pleases their own ego needs. Others are dependent on them, uh, particularly if they have high uh, control needs themselves. Uh, and then, so, so we now have fight, flight, and dependency, and there is a third very common kind of reaction to anxiety, uh, which is a two-stage response. And the first is pairing towards salvation. And the idea here is that people tend to say, well, if we can bring together two, uh, bring together a perfect pair from, as it were, the couple will come the savior. So for example, if we can bring together the scientists together with the politicians, out of that perfect marriage will come a program that will make us okay, will save us from this virus. I guess in the back of our minds, we know that politicians are rather unreliable and divided. And we know that science is always a problematic and questioning uh, pursuit. So there is no such thing as a, a, the science, the perfect science or a perfect politician. We know that scientists and politicians coming together is as much a mess as anything else. But still, we hope that coming from this. And so we give a lot of leadership into the hope for salvation from these kinds of impossible pairings. So when we observe leadership, we really see, I think, in the contemporary world, and we can look for, for some examples, we see four kinds of leadership. We see leadership that is offering salvation from impossible pairings. We see leadership that is offering us dependency. We see leadership that is offering us fight or flight. And we see leadership that is providing us with the catalytic architecture for adaptation. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Well, I think that's, that's a great um, way to, to begin this conversation. Um, I would, um, listening to you, um, you, what calls a lot my attention is about the role of the leader right now. And it has to start from, from the, their own leader. So I would like to, to go back to one thing that you, I heard you once saying that it was really power, powerful to me, that is, uh, it's, it's always time to listen carefully to our own experience. And I, I remember once uh, that we, we were talking and you mentioned how, in, how reflection increases awareness. And there is another sentence that you, you said that was very powerful to me. That is, what is reflection? And you said, reflection is to be aware of what you're doing. It is to look at yourself and to look at how you're looking at yourself. 
So I, I would kindly ask you to comment a little bit about that because while well, it seems to be the starting point to lead in this challenging environment, right? Yeah. So I guess the, the ideas I've just been describing about uh, social defenses against anxiety uh, comes from that kind of reflection. That is, reflection thinking about what kind of situation are we in and also thinking about my own thinking. Uh, you know, the, the term reflection comes from the, the Latin reflect, to refold. So I often think it's like, you know, if you have a, a, a card and this is the top, the outside surface, surface, and then we fold it and fold again, and the outside becomes the inside. So what we're doing is taking our, what we observe on the outside of our behavior and our experience, what we know about consciously, and by reflection, we take this inside and think about it deeply in there, uh, in that way. And um, I think I think there's, you know, th this is clearly important personally for an individual to have the opportunity to think about the kind of predicament, the kind of trouble we're getting into, to think about patterns in our lives, the, the sorts of things we get into over and over again, to think about why one is feeling maybe at times under pressure, at times feeling tremendously powerful and potent and energetic. All these things, you know, they come from something and to think why, what's making me feel like that? Not simply to enjoy it, but to think why, where's it coming from? Gives us, uh, it, it, in a way, more uh, capacity to manage ourselves in our roles, in our leadership roles. But also, uh, you know, reflection is a, uh, is a, Co important collective activity for strategy in a company and I imagine many people uh, listening today will be engaging in strategic reflections thinking you know who are we what really are we good at what does our strength what do our strengths depend on what are what is our real purpose what must we preserve as we go through a very very difficult economic time that's coming uh, how will we do this? What, what matters? What is the most important of our values? These are collective strategic reflections. And the processes by which this are done, ways to be reflective, uh, are you know, important to develop. And we can talk more about those in, in particular, if you like, uh, because there's a big tendency to rush to action, to say, no, right, we must immediately save cash, we must cut people, we must focus uh, our efforts here or there. Uh, and it's not yet clear that the economy will go back to normal in the same way. This might be the opportunity, the necessity for a more serious rethink about business models. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and well, it's it's, it really is time to think about what, what really matters. And I believe that the experience that we are all having staying at home, uh, we, are, we are getting more and more connected to ourselves and to what, really, what we really need, um, what, we in, what we invest our time, right? Uh, like since money is the currency of life, uh, where am I? Am I putting my, my time? Like mm. a lot of people may be staying home and saying like, why do I have so many things, right? Mm. Uh, so, so it's a good exercise to connect. But um, there are many, many challenges. And what about the ego and the, the pleasures of power and what kinds of power and how to manage, to, how to first, understand, be aware, and to manage it in the best way to be for the change that we want to, to bring. Well, I had an experience uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I was very fortunate that I had got to the bottom of my to-do list. Everything was done. And I had a few moments of an unusual pleasure of thinking, wow, I don't have to do anything. This is great. 
and I was in a, having conversation with a colleague of mine. Uh, we were talking about some new project being run by his university in Australia. Uh, and uh, I said, oh, I could do that. And he said to me, why would you want to do that? And of course, my first reaction was, I want to do it because I can, because I'm good at it. I'll do a great job. It'll be... And people, of course, will admire me and I'll have lots of contacts and I'll earn some more money from it and be great. Uh, but then I realized his question wasn't about that. His question about, Jonathan, what is it about you that makes you want to do everything? And it got me thinking about the pleasure I have in my power to do things. So uh, I started thinking then about the pleasures of power. Why, why do we enjoy and what is it we enjoy so much about power? Uh, and of course, I, this question is, is, becomes more and more interesting when you look at those of us who've given a good part of our lives to gaining power in organizations or power uh, politically or financially. Uh, as you say, when we sit now in our homes and enjoy the peace and perhaps even the relative simplicity, uh, why, what, what were we so caught up with when with this power thing? Now, I'd, of course, often people think that p uh, hunger for power is a bad thing. I don't think that. I'm just curious about what is the kind of pleasure. And I've, I've been interviewing quite a few people, and I'm doing more interviews, uh, but I have some provisional uh, hypothesis about it, which is that there's w one kind of pleasure, which is to do with identity, and particularly early on in a career, for younger people especially, that the first time somebody, you know, you gain the, you, the captain of a sports team, or given the first uh, project to look after at work, uh, this feeling is that, that I am the kind of person who has authority, who others look to. This is who I am. It's, an, I, it's a huge satisfaction for one's own identity. Uh, then a little bit later in career, there's a kind of pleasure which is, uh, you know, you're used to this. I know I'm somebody who can run things. I know I'm that kind of person. I expect to be asked to run things. And, you know, I really can make a difference. And I, now what becomes more important is thinking, what difference can I make? How can I adjust the agenda? Can I bring more equality into the, into the workplace? Can I uh, expand our services into some new territory? And these become challenges in themselves. It's not about me all the time. It's about what can I achieve out there? And I th call this the pleasures of influence. And then a little bit later, perhaps in a career, uh, one gets involved perhaps at a very senior level in a company and uh, or on board level uh, or in policy in government where you know whatever you do it's very difficult to know how much influence it has because you are part of a tremendously complex constantly moving political game around power and at this point always wondering uh, where is the next idea coming from? Uh, who, where is the agenda that's having most influence? What's the kind of language? There is a tremendous pleasure in being in the mix. It's, it's not really having power, it's powering. It's, you know, I spend my life powering, is what one might say at these senior levels. And, uh, and I call these the interactional pleasures of power where interacting amongst power with, is, is a source of pleasure in itself. So uh, I've spelt out these three kinds of pleasures, influence, uh, identity, and interaction. And uh, of course, all, kinds, all of these pleasures have downsides. So some people are really hooked on the pleasures of identity, and all through their careers, they just want to be the center of the world. And these are the people for whom their 
ego defenses are, are, are narcissistic. You know, we, I want to be, uh, I, the world is, is there for me, to serve me. And uh, it really only has meaning insofar as it's feeding me in those things. And certainly many people who get to very senior levels you know, do this more and more because they're hungry more and more and more for this narcissistic pleasure. Uh, and that can be, in the end, destructive of organizational goals uh, if, it's, if it's too much of it. Uh, uh, similarly, there are some people who really enjoy the pleasures of influence and become kind of Machiavellian, trying to control everything. These are the people for whom the ego defenses are primarily around obsession and control. And they don't necessarily need to be the front person. They don't need to be recognized or seen, but they really want to know everything that's happening and keep their hands on it and get anxious, you know, if things go on and happen that they can't, can't know, they don't know about. They never, never surprise uh, one of these people. And of course, there are some people who get to very senior levels and there are some kinds of jobs. For example, uh, I'm not so sure in Brazil, but in the UK, in the senior civil service, there are many positions which have huge influence, uh, but are not, you know, the, you don't know the name or the face, but these people have tremendous influence and gain great pleasure from a lot of power behind the scenes. Um, and then there, as I say, there are the interactional pleasures of power and these you know, sometimes people don't need to feel that they themselves are the center of attention and they don't really need to know that they are having a big influence, but they just want to be in the mix where everything is going on, where it's all, where, where, uh, where uh, and constantly trying to be always part of every group, part of every society, every association, uh, got to be there all the time. Uh, and so, th so, there are, so the pleasures do have a kind of downside and, and the way organizations work is they tend to, um, they, often, they tend to structure themselves to provide both the positive and the negative aspects of the pleasures. Uh, so, so one example is, I, I guess most organizations, uh, probably even FTC, uh, has a performance appraisal process where you know annually it's it, you know it's, it's a kind of sadomasochism where the you know the manager has to sort of threaten or uh, even if even if they do it very nicely with a lovely smile the it is the whole drama of the performance appraisal is set up in this way and you know as an as a junior going into the thing you have to kind of learn the pleasure of being subjected to this you have to learn to enjoy the submission, you know, the, sub, the role of the submissive in these things, in order to get by in organizations. Um, and so on, I could say more, but uh, yeah, so I think these pleasures of power uh, are, are, are significant, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, I'd love to hear um, um, about what are the main pitfalls you you find in organizations considering what you have just told us the main defaults the the main pitfalls oh, pitfalls um well uh so i think one of them is is the organizations uh, uh well it's a good question uh, so i think let me say some sectors some kinds of organization are particularly suited to providing some of the pleasures of power so, for example, my own career spent in universities uh, is really good at uh, providing for the pleasures of identity, uh, especially for the academics. Academics you know, have, as you, as you go through an academic career, you gain more in status, uh, more in ego rewards, but not much more in money. So the real reward is, is your, you know, is having your name everywhere, having your people, for academics, like, like soldiers wear medals on their chest, academics wear their publications, you know, 
Gosling 1986, Gosling 1987, Gosling 1987 B. Uh, you know, <laughs> these are these are things that make me feel my life is worthwhile. I am something. You know, you must know my publications, my name, and all the dates. And you know, what makes no difference to the world. Usually, you know, the average uh, number of readers, I think, of an academic journal article is 2.5 globally. And you know, these things don't really, very seldom, very seldom, do they make a difference out there in the world. But yeah, the ego is satisfied with it and all the status and the title and all that stuff. Um, and a lot of the decision making processes in universities, like, you know, the committee systems and the fiefdoms, the sort of feudal system are all done to satisfy these. They're not efficient ways to get, you know, so if it was, if a university was uh, serving the pleasures of influence, primarily, it would be much more efficient. Things would get done. Okay. How do we get things done here? What do we want to achieve? But that's not really the main purpose, you know. Uh, and I guess every organisation, every sector, uh, satisfies its own pleasures in some ways. Clearly, politician politics is 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 a lot of it's around interactional pleasures. Um, manufacturing industry is often around pleasures of influence because it really matters how you get things done, and you have to really enjoy getting things done uh, to to succeed. And contribute in manufacturing. Um, well, fantastic. And um, what comes to my mind is that um, yes, we we all want to be part of something greater than ourselves, right? And we are all all fighting to to find the best way to do that. At the end, we want to do something greater than than ourselves. And especially now. Um, facing all the challenges that we all, all, all of us leading organizations are facing. Um, there, there are some opportunities to make big changes. And what, in your point of view, like what are the opportunities that leaders can't miss now? Well, I've talked about first the opportunity for reflection, individual reflection and collective reflection about the businesses, about, about the organizational purposes. Um, just to stay briefly with universities, uh, I, again, I don't know the situation in Brazil, but uh, here in the UK, it's very unlikely that the, the business model, which has sustained UK universities, will sustain them in the future that from the next, in the next two or three months, UK higher education will have to find a new business model. And I think it's the same for many, many different sectors. And uh, for example, transportation, tourism, hotels, uh, infrastructure, energy, uh, retailing, these are all going to need new business models, new, new kinds of supply chains, new ways of doing things. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity now for uh, thinking about what we really value, what we really want to do, what our contribution is into a system which is going to be restructured. I would say perhaps one of the most important opportunities now is for leaders of organizations uh, it, to work across sectors because as, they, as one changes they will all start changing and new niches and new opportunities will open up as a result of this. So. Uh, leaders in pharmaceuticals, health sector, insurance, uh, financing, um, supply chain. You can see how all of these will be discovering new interactions and ways of working. Uh, clearly, there are going to be a necessity to take out capacity from some sectors, particularly, I guess, transport. Uh, and there will have to be, uh, and there will be opportunities for reinvention of new businesses in others. Uh, so it's a it's a great opportunity for inventive people now. So I I really hope that uh, the more senior business leaders and politi political leaders uh, and public sector leaders will provide the opportunity and the space for inventive people to work across sectors to rethink value creation. Well, that's fantastic. Um, 
it, it's all about connection, right? We'll, we'll have to survive, we'll have to, not, not only to survive, I would say to succeed. Hmm. Um, who, who will succeed will be who will be able to look at themselves first and think about, reflect, reflect about their business model, about how they can contribute to something and who they could uh, team up with to have uh, a better offer, a more useful offer, right? Um, and looking from the point of view of a business school, uh, what could be your advice for business school and professors that are dealing with the leaders? Um, how do you think uh, the business schools could help and encourage those leaders to make the first step? Uh, because we're talking about something that is a great idea, but someone has to give the first step. And I would love to hear your ideas about that. Um, well, I think uh, this is a great way to start in a, in a way by having pe people together to think about the situation we're in and to think about how to think about it, to, to invent that catalytic process to provide a catalyst, provide a temporary architecture in which new realities can emerge. And I think a business school which can draw together its alumni uh, and respected, thoughtful, courageous leaders in different sectors to work together, to think together about what is the kind of situation we're in, what do we really want to make come from this next, uh, what, what must we deal with, and what do we want to deal with? I think if you can provide that space, the inspiration and the space. So the very short answer is you can provide catalytic leadership. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. that's, that's extremely important. It's, it's about contributing, uh, even about one kind of pleasure of power, right? Indeed. It's, it's this being, being useful. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And I'm very pleased you referred to this sense of uh, participating in something bigger than ourselves, the, tra the more transcendent purpose and sense of belonging. I think, I think you're quite right about that. I agree with you. Mm. Yeah. And, and there are opportunities that we can't miss. And mm. uh, we see like everybody is trying to, to, survive, to survive, but we still have to think about what's going to be the next step, what, what we'll do to reinvent uh, what, what we do now. Yes, that's, that's very important. And I, I go back to your article, The Five Minds of a Manager, um, where you reflect, you, you tell us about all the mindsets that we should have and I would like to explore a little bit um, the, the worldly mindset uh, and what opportunities you find, uh, we can find now when the, we, like we don't have like physical barriers anymore, right? It's, it's a lot of things can, do, can be done online, can be delivered online. How we could better understand and explore it? Yes. Um, so the worldly mindset, it's a, it's a term which has a kind of nice nuance to it. On one hand, we're talking about a mindset which thinks about the whole world, which we share and we have to get, we're interdependent and we have to get along together in the, on this place. And of course, we have to preserve the conditions in the world for life. And uh, also, the term worldly wisdom refers to a kind of street wisdom, you know, to know about the way things really are, not how the th in theory we wish they were or in our ideals or our dreams or our desires, but really how things work. Uh, and, and that is a kind of worldly wisdom. And I, th I think in this uh, kind of inter, uh, in Globe, a kind of virtual globalism that we have now, there are of course opportunities to meet and talk and perhaps uh, to talk in more intimacy 
in more depth with people than we might have had and more people from around the world than we might have done before. I think the danger is that we meet and talk to the people we choose to meet to, to meet with. We meet with those who are, who want to spend time with us and we want to spend time with them. I know for myself that when I'm casting around the internet, reading, talking to people, joining webinars, reading, uh, listening to podcasts, when I start come across something which frightens or disgusts me, some kind of conspiracy theory or stereotyping or racism, uh, you know, I just turn it off. I turn away. And gradually I create for myself a kind of safe bubble, uh, which I'm feeling secure inside and I'm enjoying, but it's not really safe because it's, this is not the whole world. So the 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 danger is that we become uh, we we feel we're secure in all of these, but the the actual uh, mobilization of power, the influence, uh, is being engineered elsewhere, uh, and, we, and we don't really have a handle on the reality of what's happening because we close ourselves off to difference. Yeah, and, and it's so important if we need to connect with different people, different sector, if we have to be innovative, uh, it can't be more of the same only, right? So, Absolutely, yeah. 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 So since 2003, yeah. you were telling us to be aware about that. That means yeah. we're talking about something you wrote 17 years ago, right? Uh, uh, uh. A visionary. Mm. Um, oh, if you... Um, for you that, for you who are joining us, um, and you were not in the beginning, if you would like to make any questions, uh, just write down on the, the chat or then or in the Q and A, and I'll be happy to address the question. I have one question here from Vanderlei Soela for you, Jonathan, where he asks, uh, Professor Gosling, one of these days I heard someone saying, anxiety is an excess of the future. Hmm. It's the future in the wrong dose. Don't you think that we in business environment tend to live more worried about the future and forget or care about the present? Hmm. What a lovely question. Uh, very elegantly put. Thank you. Um, I think that, uh, of course, the future is not here. It's only the present is here. The future is here in our present imaginations. And uh, so there is a sense in which we fill up the present imagination with too much of the future, perhaps itself as a defense against recognizing or acknowledging the here and now. Um, and I think uh, I should bear, I feel guilty, I should bear some responsibility um, for constructing sort of complex concept, concepts and theories which also take the, you know, the mind into this strange construct, world of construction, three kinds of pleasures of power, four kinds of leadership, oh, all that stuff, which is taking us away from here and now uh, and, and the present. Um, so I think that it, it's a great question and I think there are kind ways of exploring and learning which give much more emphasis to awareness of the here and now particularly work developed by the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations uh, the group relations program over many years and I know there are colleagues in Brazil I think even in FTC who are working in this tradition uh, and I think it's a very important contribution for our current state mm -hmm. um, thank you I would like to, to ask you, Jonathan, about ethics nowadays, mm -hmm. ethics in leadership practices. Um, I would like to ask you about what, what's your reading of what's going on regarding ethics and the positions of the leaders um, in the middle of the crisis. And if you would have like some special advice or heads up um, 
Well, I, th I think the, that uh, you know, every exercise of choice is an ethical ex activity. And as we proceed in the next few weeks, anybody with responsibility and leadership in organizations will have to make a lot of choices. So there's going to be much ethical exercise coming up. And when people are faced with choices, of course, you turn to, me to a number of different sources. Uh, some of them are gut feel, what feels right. Uh, some of these are the kinds of character qualities, the virtues that you admire uh, and like. And those are partly personal and partly cultural. <clears throat> Um, sometimes we turn to a kind of uh, rationale, a cost-benefit kind of analysis, uh, time to judge what, you know, it, it's good, there are going to be costs to any of these choices we take, which is going to be the least harmful or the most beneficial, as far as I can tell. Uh, sometimes or people also turn to think, well, is there a moral law here? Is there a rule which always applies? You know, I should never whatever, I should never be, choose people on the basis of who I like, or I should never, whatever it is, uh, 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 I, sh I should uh, you know, never uh, destroy an ecosystem. Or, you know, so they're like sort of you know, packaged values. Um, and and uh, I guess it's going to be helpful for leaders coming into this time of choice to think more about the whole vocabulary of ethical resources to draw on. Um, in addition to those I've mentioned, uh, which are, is the gut feel, virtues, the, head, the hedonistic, the calculus, the cost benefit, uh, and the idea of there being some universal uh, criteria. And there is also uh, an exercise of, of love and care and many of the most important choices we make actually are motivated by this, not none of the other things. They're just an expression of our hum human love. And that's probably another reason we all around the world are so grateful for and so admiring our health service staff and, and others who are in some way expressing for us love and care. Yeah, it's about caring too, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, I have uh, two questions here. Let, let, let's try to cover them both. Um, one of them is from Jose Capito. He, he asks, Professor Gosling, could you please comment on how to change first steps, the need mindset of the leadership who is driven by obsession and control, considering that we need more people, interaction, engagement, empowerment, just to name a few in the whole business to make things happen and to have a better inno and innovative solutions. Uh, thank you. Yes, this is um, you know, a frequent problem is that uh, uh, people are promoted to positions of power because they're really good at controlling things. And uh, at a certain level in an, in an organization, it becomes more functional to release the control, to provide the conditions or just enough, just enough uh, definition for others to take responsibility and be creative. Uh, and sometimes this is, this is talked about as a, a kind of derailer or a self-destruct tendency where people who've been very good at one thing, been promoted because they've been so good on it, rewarded all their lives for being great at controlling, are now need to learn to be comfortable with letting go of control. And uh, I don't think there is a universal solution to this. I think each situation ha has to be addressed in its, in its own right. Um, and it's also very unusual if it's only to do with the individual. It's often the case that there are many aspects of the business which really do need control. So it's not a simple case of, uh, um, 
I don't know, a creativity good, control bad. It's always a relation of some creativity good, necessary, some control also good and necessary. Uh, so a leader to really get that balance right needs a lot of self-awareness, especially if they have to change the habits of a lifetime. And I think coaching, having a coach who you can talk to, who you can work it out, who you can really be honest with and, and uh, share your struggles and failures with is tremendously helpful. It's, it's hard to see how one could do it without someone to talk to. I think you know, in former generations, in our parents' and grandparents' generations, most of the people who obtained these senior positions were men who had wives at home who were not working. And very often, I suspect, the wives did a big part of the leadership you know, by enabling their husbands to understand what was going on in their lives. And now the women are as much involved in these things as the men, uh, that they're not available in that way to digest and think about it. And their own control needs have to be checked just as much as their husband's control needs. So, uh, so I think we've seen the rise of executive coaching matching the rise of of dual career families, yeah, in that way, to to provide that other other ear and voice and advice. Well, very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this. You know, so so many ideas. Um, we are almost running out of time, but before we we finish, um, I would like to ask you, Jonathan, if you, if there is anything that you would like to share with us that I didn't ask, or any any insight before we we finish. Well, thank you. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to for the invitation to talk, for the invitation to do so, which forced me to think these things through a bit and ha think how to express them. Uh, thank you also for the offer to give people the Coaching Ourselves session on Simply Managing because uh, this in enables people, I think, to get in a kind of conversation about the way they think. You know, the, this is precisely what it is, the structure of the five mindsets, the idea of the five mindsets invites you to think about how you think about things and it's very surprising what is released when you engage all of those so uh, i hope people enjoy them thank you so much and i'll say again the the sentence that i i mentioned in the in the middle of the conversation that is reflection is to be aware of what you're doing it is to look at yourself and to how you're looking at yourself. Isn't it powerful? That is you know, very, very powerful. Um, well, Phil, I'd like to ask if you'd like to, to make like any comments. I certainly want to thank Jonathan for that, uh, that, that talk. That was very, very good, Jonathan. Thank you very much. And, and I'll just echo what I think, uh, you know, we're feeling at Coaching Ourselves and many businesses are feeling is we're just coming to the stage where we're starting to realize that um, the decisions we're making will uh, impact our businesses for a long, long time to come. In other words, it's not just an adaptation to the current crisis, it's an adaptation for years, if not decades to come. And uh, reflection, that stopping and thinking, um, I didn't do any of it when it first hit, and I doubt many business leaders did because we reacted. Um, but now it's super important to stop and think. Uh, I strongly recommend long walks. <laughs> <laughs> and well, Phil and Jonathan, well, I'm so sorry our time is over. I could stay hours here talking with you and I, I really, I'm really flattered to have the chance to have such a great conversation with you. Like, I don't see the, the, the hour go, you know, but we have to go. And thank you very much for your time and for sharing so many great ideas, insights, and uh, advices for, for the leaders that 
we have here joining the conversation with us. And thank you all of you who stayed here with us to join the conversation. Um, it's, it's very good, good to have you close to FDC and hope to see you real soon. And um, we'll send you an email after uh, our, our web chat uh, with the Coaching Ourselves module. So you have all the information that uh, Jonathan Gosling was, was mentioning, okay? Thank you so much once again. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. All our admiration. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Take very care. Much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.